Thank you all for being here tonight. I'm so grateful and thankful for the dedicated saints that even though we take a break over the summer, you guys always come back regularly. And I'm super proud and super grateful and so honored to pastor a church where people take the study of God's word seriously. So thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, I see we have, here's what it, uh, I'm being communicated to, that we have 18 states viewing. When we say, shout out to Illinois, South Carolina, Mississippi, Michigan, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, North Carolina, Ohio, Washington State, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, California, Louisiana, Tennessee, Kentucky, Texas, New York. I see y'all. And thank you for being on with us. And six countries, Puerto Rico, Nigeria, the Philippines, Zambia, St. Kitts, and Jamaica. Let me give a shout out to all of y'all. How blessed and how pleased I am that you guys have joined us and we're, we're coming back. And I need to tell my, uh, my technical people here, you know, I used to have a clock that I could see, I could tell when my time was up. So... Uh, Y'all gonna have to help me with a with the ability to do that. So I'll try to use my computer for that, but uh, try to remember to bring that in here next time. But thank y'all for joining us. Uh, we're starting a new series tonight on the Book of Romans, and uh, it's a rich book. It's got so much significant information and teaching in it, and uh, we're going to uh, be spending a chapter a night. So we'll go through. Eight chapters, we'll take a break over the Christmas holidays and we'll pick back up sometime in February and do the final eight chapters. And let me, trust me when I tell you that the Apostle Paul's writing to the church in Rome has significant theological conversations and teachings in it for us to know and for you to know for your life. Uh, and so we're going to just spend time doing that and again uh, don't forget I think they're going to put up there if you have a question as we go all along just make sure you send in the questions and when we get to the end we'll try to take some time and answer some questions uh, tonight. Father we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity that you give us to be your children. Thank you for waking us up and giving us the activities of our limbs. Thank you that you have giving uh, us, your sons and daughters, a heart to study your word. And I want to pray that you take these next few moments and let us be your instrument, not because I earned it, not because I deserve it, but Heavenly Father, let's let me be your conduit to speak your truth to your people. And give us clarity of communications and clarity of thought and let the people have clarity of understanding. Put a hedge around not only me as I do this teaching and our facilities, but I pray a hedge around every home and every car and every building and every place where people are receiving the word, no matter where they are, no matter what part of the country, no matter what part of the world they're in. God, we pray that you would just open their eyes to your truth and give them those revelations. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Okay. Alrighty, thank you again for joining us tonight. So we're going to dive into the book of Romans. Uh, again, it is a significant, um, it is a significant uh, uh, book for us to learn and to read about. And I want to start off by giving you just some, uh, uh, some keys, some, some basic elementary things about this book so you can get an understanding. Number one, uh, this book was written most likely in the mid to late 80, uh, 80s, just, you know, 80, 50, some 20 years after Jesus was here, in the mid to late during that time frame, the Apostle Paul uh, was in Corinth. He was in the city, in the place of Corinth, and he sent it to Rome, Rome, Italy, as we call it today, uh, is where he sent it. He did have a person who wrote and subscribed for him, but it is a letter from him, and we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. And the majority of the members of the church in Rome at that time were Gentiles. We're going to find out why that is an important piece in just a few moments. But there were some Jews. There were a few Jews that were a part of, of, um, of the church, but the majority of the church in Rome were Gentiles. And that's a, that's a significant point, too, that... that in, in this 
uh, epistle to the church in Rome from Paul. Um, he's speaking to people who were not originally a part of the chosen people of God. And God uh, picked Paul. I'm, I'm running ahead of myself. God chose Paul to have the assignment of bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. And that's you and I. Whether you know it or not, you a Gentile, I'm a Gentile, we're all Gentiles. I know people have raised these questions about these black Hebrews. And um, I know people have asked me to talk about that. Listen, you all, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a black uh, Jew, people want to be black Hebrews or whatever. The bottom line is for you to be saved and make it to heaven and have a relationship with God, you're going to have to accept Jesus Christ. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of going and studying what the black Hebrews believe or what, where they stand. I'm not a fan of that. And I'm not a fan of it because ultimately what we want our people to know is Jesus Christ. Who is he? Why do we believe in him? Why do we put our trust in him? And I know there are a lot of black people who have strayed, but when they do that, they're, they're straying away from the gospel. And they are embracing another, another, uh, another gospel that's not the truth. Uh, so um, I don't know anything about them, but I just wanted to just throw that in. I also want to tell you that this book is a theological book that addresses a variety of theological issues. It touches on a number of theological truths that you and I need to know and understand. What defeats a lot of people is they just don't know what they believe. That's why there's some people who unfortunately uh, find themselves uh, going to a Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall and being told by the Jehovah's Witnesses that what the church is teaching is wrong, but the truth of the matter is they don't even know what their church teaches. And I've, I've been trying to make it a point for our people and for you to know what it is that we believe and why we put our hope and trust in Jesus Christ and why we put our hope and trust in the Bible, in the Holy Scriptures. This, this is the Word of God. And why do we put our trust in it? I want you to know that that's, that's what we, um, we're trying to get you to do and understand. Now, this is such an anointed book and so powerful, but it's full of theological issues that it addresses and uh, it gives, gives us some, some perspective on a variety of theological issues. Finally, this is just the beginning foundational things I want to tell you. It was written to both Jews and Gentiles to, to clarify that they both needed salvation. Both the Jews and the Gentiles need salvation. The Jews needed to know that just by virtue of the fact that you are a, um, let me, uh, uh, Let's pause for a second and tell by technical people because we're just trying some new things here today. I'm in a new studio here today. Uh, we can take that off. So I just want to be able to see the uh, uh, the conversations. Okay, so y'all can take the clock off. I mean, I'll just use my I'll just use my computer uh, to time myself. If I go over, the very faithful people of First Baptist will hang on with me and. If I go 30 minutes over, they'll stay with me. They, they, they love me, I believe, and they love the word. That's just why they, they love the word, so they, they'll stick with us. Okay, so anyway, I was on this last point. This last point is that this book was written to clarify to the Jews and to the Gentiles that they both and all needed to be saved, that they were all missing the mark and failed by virtue of Jesus Christ with us. And so I uh, want you to know that that's the reason that this book is written. So let's go in into chapter one and uh, we're going to start off in chapter one with the first seven verses. And what the first seven verses do is they give us Paul's identity in Christ. He is identifying who he is. And this is an again, this is a significant and important piece because he, he ultimately wants them to understand uh, uh, his authority and the basis of what he's, why he's saying the things that he's saying. He is identifying with them who he is in Christ. Let's start at verse 1, chapter 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. That's the very first, very first um, verse 
he lays out the essence of who he is. And who is Paul in verse one? Number one, he says, I'm a bond servant. That's what he says. I am a, a servant who is sold out to Jesus, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. I'm not obligated to anybody else, no organization, no structure. I'm, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Secondly, he says, he says, I'm a bond servant called to be an apostle. He says, God called me. Jesus called me to be one of his apostles. That's, again, one of the controversies that was in Paul's day that, you know, he wasn't one of the original disciples. As a matter of fact, some of you know that Paul started early uh, before he became a Christian persecuting the church. After the church got started, he persecuted the church. He participated in the stoning of some of the leaders of the church when he first got started. But God called him out of that. Isn't that great news that God can call you out of whatever you're in? And put you in a place where you can be everything God wants you to be and do what he wants you to do. So he says, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. I'm called to be an apostle. And he says this. He says, I'm a separated servant to the gospel. I am a separated servant to the gospel. We call that sanctification, to be separated out. That God has picked you and separated you from the world and worldly things. All of us at some point in our lives need to be sanctified, separated to the gospel uh, of the Lord. And so this is what Paul is identifying himself, who he is and what it is that he does. Let's look at verse two. He goes to verse two and says, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now that's again, verse two is another significant thing that he says. Uh, Paul, Paul says, Oh, let me hold up. I'm, I done messed up this thing here. Let me uh, get it straight here. Verse 2, he says, oh, give me just a moment here. Um, man, we got technical issues today. Verse 2, his assignment was promised. Verse 2, his, his assignment of what all God called him to do was promised through the prophets in the scripture. What God called him to do and what his assignment was was manifested and promised to him through prophets before even today, even before his time. God prophesied through the prophets and in the scriptures of the assignment and the gifting and the anointing that would be on Paul's life. And you all need to know the same thing about you, that God has an assignment and a call upon your life. Verse three, let's go to verse three. He says in verse three, he says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. What does that say? It means this, that God's son was born through the seed of David. This again is what the scriptures prophesied, that the Messiah, God's son, would come through the lineage of David. And that's how it's one of the reasons we know who he is. He came down. That's why you see these genealogies in the scriptures that to show us that Jesus came to us through the promises of the scripture that go way back to Abraham's time. When God says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, that I will bless you and you will be a blessing to, to, to the nations and the world and generations. Jesus comes through that lineage. And so the the purpose, one of the purposes of all of the. The genealogies you see is to help us see that Jesus comes through that lineage and and he was born through the seed of the, he came through David. And so that's how we that's one of the reasons we know who he is, is that he came through that. Look at verse number four. It says in verse number four, look at verse number four. It says this. It says, um, and declare to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. There's a, oh, that's profound. And declared to be, he's declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Those are the things that affirms that Jesus is who we said he is. Um, yeah, I have to tell you that some of this is not coming up and I don't know if it's going to show up, but but let me let me read my notes to you. Verse verse number number four, verse number four and verse number five 
are not going to show up on your screen for some reason. I'm not sure where that is. It showed up when I did this earlier, but something happened and it's not there. But here's what your note should say. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the Holy Spirit and by his resurrection from the dead. We know he is God's Son. We know that he is the Son of God. How? Because the Holy Spirit makes it known to us the, by the Holy Spirit and by the fact that he was raised from the dead. He did what nobody else did. He conquered death. He was raised from the dead. And then verse 5 says this, through, through him we have received grace, Paul says. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Through him, we have received grace. Through, through, um, through Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship. He got both those things, the grace of God and the apostolic calling so, he, so that he could be obedient to the faith, that he could put his trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and be able among all the nations for his name, be able to declare it and be able to show it and demonstrate it among all the nations for his name's sake. Then we come to verse six. It says, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. You and I too are called and we too are called by Jesus Christ. He has called us to be the, to do the same work that the apostle Paul did. We are called to share the gospel. We are called to live the gospel among whom you also are the called of Jesus. We've been called by him. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called you and I, and that's why we're saved today because he called us. That's great. Oh, y'all know that's great news that God called us out of where we were. And then verse seven, as a matter of fact, this identity that Paul identifies about himself and about us is in these first seven verses. And here's, I'm sorry, verse 7 won't show up either. I have to apologize to y'all. Don't know why that's not showing up. Uh, they're not even putting it up, but it's not showing up on my, um, my iPad here today for some whatever reason. It worked earlier, but it's not working now. But I know those of you who are taking notes, uh, just follow this point right here. It says, he addresses all who are in Rome, who are beloved of God and called to be saints. He addresses all who are in Rome, who are beloved of God and called to be saints. He extends grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ. So basically, hey, he's addressing the church in Rome and he's saying to them who are loved of God and those who are called to be saints of God. He extends to you the grace and the peace that the Father and Jesus Christ gives to you. Isn't that great news? That God has done that for us. So that's, that's something that we celebrate. So that's, that's the first seven verses of Romans chapter one. He uh, identifies who, who he is. Then he goes to uh, the second part of this, beginning at verse eight, verses eight through 15. Uh, Paul um, talks, it talks about his, in, his enthusiasm for them, his enthusiasm for uh, the saints of God. If y'all could put that up there real quick, that they could see that, amen, that uh, Paul is mentioning, not the verse, but the, uh, the PowerPoint, please. Thank you very much, the PowerPoint. Um, Paul's enthusiasm for them. Y'all, maybe y'all, maybe there's a problem. They're trying to work on it. They can't get it. But here's what he says in verse eight. He says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So Paul is celebrating their faith. He is saying that everybody around the world, you've been mentioned, what you believe has been mentioned around the world. What you believe has been mentioned around to other saints around the world, he mentions. And then Paul says this uh, in verse number nine. Let me go to verse number nine. He says, um, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. So his enthusiasm for them is that, hey, look, I'm praying for you regularly. That's what he says. Paul prays for them on the regular, on the on a routine basis. 
he's calling and praying for them and mentioning them in his prayer. So that's verse number nine he's mentioning. Verse 10 says this. Look at verse 10. He says, making requests if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Basically, Paul is saying, I'm desirous to come to you. I'm seeking to visit you. I want to be around you. And so I'm praying that God would make that possible, that I can come and spend some time with you. That's verse 10. In verse 11, he says this. He says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That's verse number 11. Paul is desiring to make an, an impartation of the spiritual gifts that's in him, in them, and help them get established. You know, it's important who you hang around. It's significant who you sit under. It's significant who it is that you allow to lay hands on you, who you allow, who you allow. And so Paul basically says, and, I, and, I, and I, again, I love this. He's saying, I want to depart and impart in you some spiritual gifts that I want to put in you. I, I want to I be in your presence and I want to help you get established so that you can be everything God wants you to be. And let me challenge you all today. Paul's enthu he's, enthusi he's, he's enthusiastic for them. And I want to tell you today I'm enthusiastic for you, but I do want to warn you to be careful who you hang around, who you, you know, I know some people listen to everybody teaching. You, you just, you're all over the map. That's why you're confused because you, you're eating from too many tables. Be careful who you allow to make a deposit in you, saints. That's, that's the truth. Try to eat from the same stream and, you know, from, from the same thing. Let's go to verse 12. That is that I may be encouraged together with you, verse 12, by the mutual faith, both of you and me. He says in verse 12, my visit would be to, to be encouraged that I, he said, Paul said, I would be encouraged and you would be encouraged. Mutual faith, both of you and me, that you both would be encouraged. He says, that's, that's my level of enthusiasm and excitement that you, that, uh, that the visit would be an encouragement, that we could be an encouragement to each other. That's what he's saying. Verse 13, he says this. Look at verse 13. He says, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So Paul is saying, I'm recognizing, Paul says, I'm desiring to come to see you, uh, but I got stopped. I got hindered. But I wanted to see you make, bear some fruit, that, that the deposit I would make in you would bear fruit. Uh, and that just as I've seen fruit b being born in other Gentiles, I want to see some fruit born in you. Uh, again, that's y'all. That's what we're called to do. We are called to be in a place and a posture to bear fruit. You should be bearing fruit. You should be bearing fruit of your character. You should be bearing fruit of winning others to Jesus. When's the last time you bore fruit, won somebody to the Lord? When's the last time you demonstrated uh, the fact that you have character, you're bearing the fruit of some character, or even bearing the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all those things that the Scriptures talk. Are you bearing fruit? That is ultimately the question that must be asked. And then finally, verses 14 and 15, that closes out this section of, of the apostles' enthusiasm for them. Verses 14 and 15 says, it says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. I love the way this whole language is voiced. Paul says, I, I owe it to the Greeks and I owe it to the barbarians. In other words, to the wise and the unwise, the people who seem to have it together and the people who don't have it together, the smart people and the not so smart people. As much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to everybody. I'm not going to hold back. That's what I hear Paul saying. I'm not going to hold back sharing the gospel with you or anybody else. I'm prepared to preach the gospel. Uh, I am ready to do that even also to you who are in Rome too. I'll come and share the gospel and teach and make deposits in you too. And I hope that all of you are at a posture or a place that you can say the same thing, that you're ready to share the gospel. We've tried to make the people in our church prepared 
and ready to share the gospel. We, we try to do everything in our power to put you in situations where you can hear the truth and understand the truth. The classes we offer, the conferences, we, we want you to know the gospel. We want you to be prepared to win others to Jesus, to speak a word in due season to somebody who's encouraged. That's one of the, that's one of the cornerstone elements of our church, that we are a teaching church and we are thrilled and excited of what we're doing. And, and, and we're like Paul. We are ready to preach to you the gospel, to you who are in Glen Arden too, to you who are in Prince George's County, to you who are in Maryland and all these other states. I just got to notice we got people from South Africa and Canada also added from other parts of the world. Isn't that amazing? These people must get up in the wee hours of the morning and we're ready to share the gospel with you too. That's what our call and our assignment is. So that's verses 8 through 15 that Paul demonstrates his enthusiasm for them. And then when we get to verses 16 and 17, here's the next section. These two, these two sections that talks about the fact that the just live by faith. The people who are the just people, the people who are, are in right standing with God, who are in the proper posture with God. It says that they are living by faith. Look, at, let's read verse 16. He says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Gentiles. There's another, that's a profound verse right there. Let me just stop and stick a pen. Paul says, I'm not ashamed to share the gospel. I'm not, I'm, I don't hide behind anything. I'm proud to share the gospel. He says, it, you know why? He says, because it is the power of God to bring salvation. That word salvation means deliverance. He says, if people need to be deliverance, the gospel will bring deliverance. I don't care what you're going through, what your challenge might be. The gospel will bring you deliverance. He says, it is the power of God uh, to salvation for everyone who simply puts their faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Isn't that exciting, y'all? Jesus said, if you just believe in me, not just put credence that I exist. The devil do, does that. The devil knows that Jesus existed. But if you believe that I died on the cross for your sins, that you could be forgiven and have access to his father. If you believe that he died on the cross and took the pain and the punishment for your sin, if you believe that he was buried and rose again from the dead, if you believe that he conquered death and rose again from and you know the thing that God did? He made it available to the Jews first, but they didn't accept it. They rejected it. But he made it available now to us Gentiles, to the Greek, to the outsiders, those of us who were not born in the Jewish family. God opened up salvation to us. We are now members of the family of a holy God. Thank the Lord that he did that for you and I. He made it possible for us to have a relationship with him even though we were outsiders. So we were, we were aliens, one, one scripture says. We, we were aliens, but now God has made it possible for us. And then he says in verse 17, go to put verse 17 in it. It says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let me read that again. For in it, in what? In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel, the, to be in right standing with God. The word righteousness means to be in right standing with God. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is manifested and revealed. And it goes from faith to faith. And it is written, because we believe by faith, the just shall live by faith. Those who are in the right standing with God shall live by faith. Faith. We're people of faith. We don't look at the circumstances. We don't look at what's around us. No, we don't do that. That's not how we live. We live by faith. We get a word from God. We live by faith and we trust God. We believe that he's a way maker. We believe that he's a burden bearer. We believe that he's a healer and a deliverer. We live by faith and that's how we make our choices. We, you know, some, some, some people want to see it. Thomas doubted and he wanted to see it. Jesus said, blessed are those who believe even though they didn't see Thomas had to put his reach up and touch the, 
the nail prints in his hands and the scars in his side and the nail prints in his feet. Then he said he believed. But Jesus said, blessed are those who don't see, but yet they do believe. Thanks be to God that, that God has called us to be people of faith. I hope I'm not going too fast for you. I'm hoping I'm making sense to you. The just shall live by faith. We are people of faith. Paul is driving that point home. Now, I'm going to slide over to, to the next section because he's talking something that's, again, very important and very significant that I really need you to get. And here's what he talks about this in verses 18 through 32. We're going to spend the, the, the remaining part of our time Addressing this point, what happens when people willfully reject this gospel? What happens to people who willfully refuse to believe, who hear the gospel and walk away, who hear what Jesus has to say, to hear the teaching of the word and reject it? There are consequences to it. Look at verse 18. Let's start with verse 18. Matter of fact, I'm going to read verse 18 and 19. Here's what it says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifested in them for God has shown it to them. This is profound and important. Let me read it again. For God, here's what it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. People who are ungodly and unrighteous, who suppress the truth. They live in their unrighteous deeds and they suppress, they reject it, they kick, kick out, they don't want to hear it. They, they suppress it. They suppress the truth of God's word. And it says in verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And this is this is important. God gave them the opportunity. God made their gospel known to them. He manifested. They heard it. They've been exposed to it, but yet they rejected it. They got exposed to the truth, but they rejected it. It was known of God to them and manifested. And God shown them the truth. Somebody say, well, how did that happen? What, what, what went on? I'm glad you asked the question. So verse 18 and 19, God's wrath is revealed against this ungodliness and this unrighteousness. God's wrath is revealed to them. But look at verses 20 through 23. It spells it out even more. Verse 20. Let me read verse 20. It says, for since the cre this is, oh, my God, y'all need to highlight this verse right here. This is a very significant verse. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This is important. If this is not already highlighted in your Bible, you should highlight it. Because God's attributes are seen in creation. We, we see the nature and the attributes of God by just going outside and seeing nature. When you see the wind blow, when you see the sun up in, in the sky, when you see the reflection of the sun in the moon, when you see the plants and when you see all of what God has created, it is a manifestation. It shows us the attributes of God. His, his eternal power is revealed in nature. You cannot, you know what this is saying? You can't deny that there's a God who made all this. I know they want to say this evolved. That's great. Oh, Lord. Evolved from where? Somebody had, to, somebody had to be the mastermind behind all of how this was created. And, and that's what this scripture is saying. The things uh, since the world was created, his, God's attributes are clearly seen and they can be understood by the things that have been made. God's character can be understood by the things he made in nature. Uh, even, even his, it says his eternal power in Godhead so that you have no excuse about the existence of an eternal God. There is absolutely no excuse you can make about the existence of a holy God. When you just look at nature, how no, no, a human couldn't have done it. it, it didn't, we didn't evolve. I know that's what, 
the world wants to say we, there was no evolution. If it was evolution, people ain't still evolving. Monkeys ain't still becoming men. I mean, if, if evolution was true, they'd be still evolving. No, that's that's not how it works. So, um, so, so uh, that's verse twenty. Let's look at verse uh, twenty-two and twenty-one and twenty-two. Here's what it says: Because although they knew God, verse twenty-one, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse twenty-two, professing to be wise. They became fools. There, here's verse 20 and 22. There is a danger in knowing about God, but failing to glorify or thank him. That's dangerous. That you know, you know that there is a God, but you fail to glorify him. Or you fail to give him thanks. It, and the consequences is, it says that you will get futile thoughts, futile hearts. And it's a serious problem when you have the opportunity to glorify God and the opportunity to thank him and the opportunity to have a relationship with him. But you refuse and you reject it. Uh, the scripture tells us that's a very serious problem. It says your foolish hearts will be darkened. That's what verse number 23, 21 says. Your foolish hearts got darkened because when you had the opportunity, you failed to do it. And you think you're so wise, verse 20. 22, you think you're so wise that really you're foolish. Man, that's, that's again, that's, that's a profound and a very important, important piece. Verse 23, let me read, read, read verse number 23. It says, and here's what it did, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts, animals and creeping things. You know what that's saying? They changed the existence of the incorruptible, invisible God and made, made God into creatures, made God into uh, image. They made an image of God in animals uh, and worshipped the animals, birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. That, that they, they became the God. They worshipped that uh, rather than recognizing that there was a God behind who created all of that. And there are some people today who actually have that, that mindset and they have that heart. And that's a very dangerous place and unfortunate place to be in. And so we want to challenge and encourage us not to fall down that path. Now, we're going to go to the last section of this. And again, this is again talking about verses 18 through 32. We're going to, we're going to get in some tough, here's some, some, some challenging things right here. What happens when people willfully reject Jesus? Verses 24 through 32. Verse 24. Therefore, here's what happens when you reject God, don't want to hear from God, don't want to honor God. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Who, Lord. God will surrender you over to uncleanness and to the lust of your heart. You, he said, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you go ahead and since you don't want to honor me and love me and rec recognize me and thank me and worship me, God says, I'm going to give you over. I'm going to surrender you over to uh, your uncleanness, your refusal to honor and worship the living God. He says, uh, and he says, not only that, in verse number 24, in verse 25, he says, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So look at that. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. The creator is to be blessed forever. And they, they worshiped and they exchanged God's truth and worshiped and served creatures, animals. That's who they worshiped. That's who they bowed down to rather than the living God, the creator who made these things. So they, they will dishonor their bodies among themselves and they will exchange God's truth for the lie. They will exchange God's truth for the lie. They will worship and serve the creature instead of the creator. 
Oh, that's a dangerous place, a dangerous, a dangerous posture to be in. And then it says this. Here's another significant thing. Verse 26 and 27. Look at verse 26 and 27. It says, um, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Stick a pen right there. Now, I, I, I mean, to me, this is so crystal clear what this is talking about. This is crystal clear talking about the lifestyle of men with men and women with women. That's not God's plan. And I think it's unfortunate that in our country, a lot of pastors and a lot of churches have reneged on this. I, I, don't, I don't even know how they justify, how they answer this. They, they, I guess they want to excuse it and say it's not for us today or whatever. I don't know. But, but this, is the, the, this was inspired and written by Paul by virtue of the Holy Spirit that he wrote to them. And, and Paul knew that, that you know, this issue of homosexuality and lesbianism in the church is, and in the world, not just in the church, but in the world, that this is in fact um, th this verse right here is the verse that spells out God's heart about this. And there are other verses, too. We can go back in the Old Testament. For those who think that the warning against that is just in the Old Testament, this book right here, Romans, is in the New Testament. It's, it is consistent with the, the warnings in the Old Testament. Here, this verse is right very much so in line with what was said in the Old Testament. That, that uh, God gives you over. You don't want to serve him. You don't want to love him. You don't want to honor him. He gives you over to, he says, to your vile passions. You're doing things that you just go, you get, you're burning with lust and you're doing something that's unnatural. It's unnatural. It's not, you're not made, a man's not made to be with a man. A woman's not made to be with a woman. That's not, that's not God's design or plan. And I, and I know you know, this this be something that's problematic for a lot of people. So God says, verse 26 and 27, here's my point. God also surrenders them to these vile, vile passions. They will do what isn't natural, women with women and men with men. They will receive the penalty of their error. That's verses 26 and 27. At some point, they will have to suffer the consequences. I, I you know... I'm not telling us as a church or as Christians that we shouldn't hate on those people. I, I, I do want to say that, you know, the church in its past have treated people who, who have been in these lifestyles horrifically. The church has not, been done, has not shown the love of God. And I want to say to you all, we as a church show love to people regardless of what their, you know, how they live in their lives. We show them the love of God. And it is the love of God that will show them uh, we, we demonstrate the love of God to show them that God loves them and God can deliver them. We, we're called to show and demonstrate that to them. That's what God calls us to do. And so I know some years ago, uh, and I say it again today, I apologize for how the church has treated people like that, people who have been in that kind of lifestyle. We, we've called them names and we've rejected them and hated on them. No, we're not to do that. We're to love them. But we're not going to, we love you, but we're not going to back down on the teaching of scriptures. You know, this is one of the big debates in the Christian church today. There's churches and denominations dividing over this issue. And for those who don't know, it is this verse, these verses here that demonstrate why, why it is that um, churches like us are rock solid on this position and this belief. God says, I'll, if that's what you want to do, I'll give you over to your vile passions. That's what, Jesus, that's what the scripture calls. Paul says it's a vile passion. If that's what you want to do, we will, you go ahead and do it. But you will suffer consequences to it. And that's, what, that's the gospel. That, that's what we preach. We, we will not ignore the teaching of the scriptures. Let me go on because I want to try to make sure I get through chapter 1 uh, while we're here today. Verse 28. Here's what it says. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, 
God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Wow, that's another thing. They refuse. Here's, here's my point here. They refuse to retain the knowledge of God and God gives them over to debase, reprobate, backwards thinking mindset, backwards uh, posture, backward beliefs. That's what um, debase means, that you, you think in the opposite of what's true is what he says. God gives you over to the debased thing to, to, to do those things which are not fitting. At verse 28, verse 29 through 31, I'm almost finished. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, verse, 20, verse 30, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. There's a list of things down here, he says in these verses. What do they mean? I, I took a stab at just giving you a brief meaning what some of these words mean. Let's, let's, let's roll down through them. Sexual immorality means sex outside of marriage. Se fornication, that's really what it means. Pornea, it is sexual immorality. Wickedness, that means you're insincere, insincerity in your heart. That's what wickedness means. Covetousness, it means greed. It means you have a, a posture of, of, of being greedy. God gives you over to your greed. Maliciousness. Um, let's see, that's not go there. It is maliciousness, that's malice. It's, it's something in your heart to try to hurt and bring pain to others. That's what that malice means, or maliciousness. It means malice, it means you purposely seek to bring harm to others. That's a dangerous place to be full of envy. You know what that means? To be jealous, full of jealousy. You want what other people have. I don't know where y'all are, but in my life, I just don't, I only want the things that God wants me to have. I don't want nothing you got. I don't want you. I don't want your wife. I don't want your kids. I don't want your house. I don't want, I don't want anything that you have. I want what God has for me. And this says there's some people that are full of envy. They cannot be content with what God gave to them. So they're full of jealousy. That's what that means. Murder. It means to be killing. Now, the intentions of hurting or taking someone's life. Now, I, you know, when I first studied this, when I was a young man, I, I can never envision somebody actually being a murderer. But, you know, I, I, I watch some of these shows on TV where people are on purpose plotting to kill their spouses, to kill their co-workers, to kill their friends, to just, I, it, just it blows my mind that a human being would have the capacity to take another person's life. But yet, it's happening every day, every day. I mean, and, and, th and some, they're doing it thinking they can get away with it. it you, God has given you over to a, a, a way of thinking and a heart because you, you want to be satisfied with your vile passions. God gives you over to that. Okay, let's go on to, to the next list. Strife, it's, here's the next point, strife. That means contentions. Y'all ever met somebody who's always, they, they like to argue. They like to debate on different things. That's strife. They, they, keep, they keep contentions going. They keep arguments going. That's the work of the flesh. Deceit. That means treachery. It means to be uh, deceitful. It means you're, you're, you're doing things to, 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 to take advantage of other people is, is what it means. Evil mindedness. It means you're wishing evil or harm to others. You want to see other people harmed. Whisperers. This is an important one, too. Gossip. That, the whisperer is a gossiper. Y'all have heard me define gossip as being a person. When somebody comes to you and they want to talk to you about something that you are not a part of the problem nor the solution, that's gossip. And some of y'all are gossip kings and queens. It's a work of the flesh. Um, the Bible calls it sin, and you're, you're, you, those of you who enjoy you know, listening to gossip and hearing stuff about other people, let me warn you that that's a work of the flesh, 
and and don't don't that's not something you want to do. Don't let people do that. Backbiters. That means a slanderer is what that means. A slanderer. What is a slanderer? Slander means to tell the truth somebody with a design to hurt their names, hurt their reputation. That's what a slanderer is. That's what a backbiting is. It means I'm seeking to hurt you and bring damage to you, damage to your life, damage to your reputation. Uh, and what you might be saying is the truth. But guess what? There's truth on all of us. You got truth. I got truth. All of us got some truth on us. And the, and the fact of the matter is, I, I, don't, I don't want people you know, broadcasting my truth, and you don't want people broadcasting your truth. We all got some truth that we've told that's problematic. That's, not, that's a work of the flesh. Haters of God, just simple and clear, they hate God. This, they just hate God. Haters of God. Violent. Accusative. That means you're accusatory of people. Um, proud, it means that you're arrogant. God hates arrogant. God hates a proud person. The scripture says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the plans of the arrogant who think they have it all together, who think they're so high and mighty, who know it all, who got it all together. God's, God's not on that page. You, you will not move forward being a person who's proud. And it's going down through this list. Boasters. That word boasters means to be a braggart. You brag. Y'all met some braggers before. Every time you turn around, they bragging on something. They, they did this. They bought that. They went here. They went there. Yeah, wherever you are and whatever you do in, God, in, in life, you do by the grace of God. By the grace of God, you, you get the job you have. By the grace of God, you live the life that you have. By the grace of God, not by your doing. You're not so, you're not so great and high and mighty. God did it for you. He's the one who made that happen for you. Inventors of evil things. Those who create bad things is what that means. You create bad. Disobedient to parents. Self-explanatory. I don't even need to give a definition of what that means. It means those who don't honor their parents. And it means those who are rebellious to what their parents tell them to do. Undiscerning. It means foolish and without common sense. You don't op operate with with common sense. You're without sense, undiscerning, unable to discern right from wrong, unable to discern. You act like a fool, he's saying. Untrustworthy. That word untrustworthy means without faith. You, you have no capacity to have faith in the Lord Jesus. Unloving. It means your heart, your, your emotions are dead. You, and you know what? If you continue into a lifestyle of immorality, you will lose feelings. You will lose compassion. You will lose uh, a heart. Unforgiving, meaning unwilling to reconcile to others. You, you are unwilling to forgive others. You're unwilling to get, get your relationships right with others. That's a work of the flesh. All of these are the consequences and the things that God gives you over to. Um, you be filled, he says, you'll be filled with unrighteousness. And if any of these are in your lifestyle, that is a problem. And then finally, he says, unmerciful. You have no mercy. You, you will not extend mercy to anyone else. So I tell you, this is a, this is a problematic deal. This is, this is, um, this is a, a really uh, challenged thing that... God gives us mercy. Every day we wake up, it's the mercy of God. And some of you are in positions where you can extend mercy, but you don't. You're unmerciful. This is a warning, God says. Don't, don't be unmerciful. Now, let me close this with verse number 32. I'll be finished. Here we are with verse. Let me finish this last point with verse 32, and I'll be finished with verse chapter 1. It says this. Who, knowing the righteousness who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who, here's verse 32, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. Those who practice these things deserve death, separation from God. And you not only practice them, but you also give an amen to those and you celebrate and approve of those who, who also do those things. Yeah, you, 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 practice, you practice it and then you say amen to others who do it. That's, that's, that's the opposite of God. It is the opposite of the will of God. 
So I, I, I just want to say to you all tonight and encourage you tonight that um, Paul has given us a clear warning today that we don't want to reject the gospel. That's what it all boils down to. Don't reject the gospel. Don't reject what God says. Now, I only have a couple minutes left, and I see I have just a couple of questions that have come in. And let me see if I can answer one. Will God penalize them, homosexuals, if they believe in God and go to church? Well, you know, here's what I believe. I believe that, you know, all of us have weaknesses and shortcomings. All of us sin and miss the mark. And if you're a child of God, at some point, the Holy Spirit will deal with you, with your sin. He will tell you that you're not right. You're not living it right. And you ought to repent and get right with God. Um, you, you, do, you, you, know, you can't say I'm a Christian and I just ignore that and walk away from that and, uh, and, and not walk away from that and just continue to walk. You can't reject the gospel. That's what rejecting the gospel means. He says, I don't believe that. I don't accept that. I'm going to just keep doing what I'm doing. That's the problem if it's a lifestyle. So, you know, people may falter and fail in certain areas, but I believe we serve a God that if you repent, you got to have a heart of repentance. We always want to have a heart to repent and, and, and strive to live righteously. Strive to do what's right. Try, strive. I don't care what your issue is in life. I don't care where your failures are in life. Put yourself in situations and circumstances where you can make the right choices and do the right things. Get around the people not those who celebrate your wrong, celebrate your lifestyle. Get in a situation where you can honor the truth of God's word. And be you a homosexual or a fornicator or whatever your life might, might be. Any of these things. I just went through all of these lists of things. You know, you might be unforgiving or unloving or a hater of God or proud or whatever your issue is. Don't accept it as a lifestyle, saints. Fight. Fight to do right. Fight to be pleasing to God. Fight to be in the right place with him. Fight to obey God. Don't, don't give yourself over. When you just give over and say, I'm just, this is who I am. I'm just going to live that way. The Bible calls that lasciviousness. You just give over to sin. And there's a problem when you just give yourself over to sin. Don't do it. War and fight yourself. And the grace of God, if you humble yourself, God will give you his grace to do what's right. Put yourself in environments and situations and around people who will challenge you and teach you the word of God and hold you accountable. Be in situations where you can get in that word. It's the word that's going to help you do right and live the right way. Get in that word. Thank you all for joining me today. My time is up. It's, I see I got one minute left and I'm grateful for you all joining me. Thank you for I, I did. I know I got some other questions. I'll try to answer those next time. Let me try to pick up on those questions next next time and uh, get back with you. But thank you all so much for joining us. If listen, if you're watching us and you say, you know what? I want to get right with God. I want to be in the right posture, and right place with him. There's going to be a phone number that comes up on the screen. There's going to be an email address. There's going to be a button that you can click that will that will help you. We can help you get in the right place with God. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, he forgives. He, you know why we serve Jesus? He forgave us of our sins. He is a forgiver of sins. And he'll forgive you. Thank the Lord that he's a forgiver of sins. He'll forgive you. I don't care what you did, when you did it, how recently you did it, how often you did it. He will forgive you. That's what the blood of Jesus did. He forgives us of our sins. Call that phone number. Send us an email. Click that button. And we'll give you directions. Father, thank you that you are a merciful God, that you have sent your son to die, that if we simply put our faith in what he did on the cross for us, we'll be your children. I pray that you help your sons and daughters today. Somebody watching right now, Lord, who's struggling and raising the question of, where will they spend eternity? Draw them to yourself, almighty God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you next week, everybody. God bless.